before uh, Paul was executed uh, by Nero, um, he gave a prophetic word at the end of his life, uh, and Second uh, Timothy is the, the word that he gave. It's in chapter 3. Uh, and so here he is facing uh, Neronian uh, execution, uh, and this is what Paul says about the last days. He says in verse 1 of uh, chapter 3 of Second Timothy, he says, but realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be, and then he begins to list what you can see, lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, uh, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable. I mean, you can't ever get to first base with them. Malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. They hold to a form of godliness, uh, although they have denied its power. Avoid such men as these. Uh, You could basically go through that list and go, check, 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 check. Uh, In the last uh, three months, uh, we've seen uh, our nation uh, in, in, a, in a most difficult situation, have we not? I mean, I don't even have to explain to you how, how uh, treacherous the situation has been and how complex the situation is and how sinful the situation is. Um, a lot of things have happened in, since we have uh, uh, met last, as it were. Uh, and when I, when I see what's going on in our culture, uh, uh, Number one, I'm thankful that the Word of God tells us what to expect, because uh, you can anticipate these things prior to the coming of the Christ. But it also helps us set the stage for, well, what's the answer? Uh, the answer is not going to be more laws, more rules, more litiga- litigation, more uh, things from the culture. Uh, the answers to the, the problems that we see in our culture are going to come from the Word of God. Uh, and that's what you see when you read the Psalter. Uh, the Psalter is applicable to any time, any age. The principles there are there to bring wisdom, guidance, and understanding. So when you live at a time like ours where there is all kinds of issues, uh, and, and it's not just one issue, they're, they're stratified, uh, whether it's a racial injustice, whether it's injustice shown to our great police officers, uh, rioting, looting, all the things that we have seen, um, as desperate as they are, how are we ever going to get to a point of of peace, of shalom, uh, of answers, real answers. Uh, what you'll see in Psalm 10 is uh, uh, David gives answers uh, in this great word uh, because he's going to share his heart. Uh, and as, as you read through what he says here, uh, look for uh, timeless truths that were applicable to his day that were tumultuous, which are still applicable to our day because those answers are the answers that work. And so when you read Psalm 10, uh, and it is 18 verses long, uh, and yes, it is possible for us to do this because there are not multiple services and there's only one, there's no end to this service. So I think it's awesome. Uh, but Psalm, Psalm 10, uh, it, it, is a, it is a sharing from David's heart. And if you read it and sit back and ask yourself, what was that just about? Uh, it is summarized in, in my estimation in this one point. Uh, how can a Christian, how can Christians uh, have hope when the world around you seems utterly hopeless? And, and that is, that's how I feel when I read the news, watch the news, listen to commentators, watch what's going on. It's like, it looks hopeless. But no, there's hope. And, and the hope comes from what you're going to see in Psalm 10. So he, he's going to give us uh, three movements of thought as he moves through uh, sharing his, his frustration as the king of a, of a godless nation uh, that has tons of issues. Uh, and as you work through his, uh, his emotional presentation, uh, you're going to probably identify with him. Uh, and then you'll hopefully you'll identify with some of his solutions. And so he's going to get real here. This is going to be David in the raw. Uh, and we want to look at what he says. Number one, he says, if you want to head toward hope, you must be open about your problems. Because if you don't talk, you can't get help, correct? So he says, be open. And this is what he's going to do in these verses. Uh, he's going to share nine things that are on his heart. And they're, they're not positive things. If you came for a totally uplifting Positive message for the first part of this message. Uh, that's not going to happen for a few minutes. We'll get there. But David's going to share his heart about what's going on in his culture. So he's going to be open before God with that. So when you look at what's going on in our world, all the atrocities that are, that are done against all sorts of people, of, of, whether it's a police officer uh, who's just doing his job or it's somebody that has had some kind of racial injustice done against them, whatever has happened in our culture, do you bring that to God or just complain about it or just make observations about it or get frustrated about it? See, David was a man who would say, this is what I see, but I gotta go to God and talk to him about it. That's exactly what he did. 
So we want to look at how David goes through uh, his uh, sin-tainted, sin-warped culture and then arrives at a place of hope. Uh, in verse 1, he asks God a question. And I will preface, preface it to say, if you're going to ask God questions, you better be very careful about the tone of which your question is. Uh, this is a very respectful question coming from a, a, a man who struggles with evil. Notice what he says. He says to God, why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide your face in times of trouble? Translated, God, where are you? The nation's fallen apart under my leadership. I'm trying to lead them to holy things, and it keeps disintegrating around me, and I kind of feel like you're not around. Ever felt like that? Uh, in Hebrew, the very first word here, why, lama, uh, lama Yahweh, is totally emphatic in the Hebrew text. He's going before the throne of God, and he's saying, God, this place is falling apart. Where are you? Where are you? Why are you hiding yourself? Um, ever felt like that? Uh, ever wondered where God was when evil seems to run amok and is, have no divine curtailment? Ever talk to your television? or computer screen. I have many times an utter frustration. And you, you sit back and you think, God, when, when are you gonna do something? When are you gonna deal with evil? When are you gonna come down and bring righteousness? I mean, where are you? Seems like you're in hiding. But notice he says, Lord, why, why do you stand afar? And when he uses the word Lord here, it's capital L-O-R-D. Uh, it isn't in this translation, but, but it should be, because it's Yahweh. And that's the eternal God, which we talked about uh, recently in, in as our study of uh, Psalm 8. He says, when I'm addressing God, I'm addressing the eternal God, which means he knows God's there because he's eternal. He just wonders why God, who is there, isn't doing something about the evil that he sees. Again, when times are tough, what should you do? Well, you should go to God, and you should get real with God, and that's what David's gonna do. Nine things that are on his heart, uh, and these nine things might be applicable to our day and age as well. So he shares his heart. Number one, he says in verse two, uh, in pride the wicked hotly pursue the afflicted. Let, let them be caught in the plots with which they have devised. Uh, that would be like an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, lex talionis. You know what they're doing to godly people, God I wanna live to see that coming back around on them so righteousness can reign. And what does he say the godless are doing? He says uh, in pride, in arrogance, wicked people are hotly pursuing the afflicted people, the, the people that are at a disadvantage. Uh, he says they're, they're pursuing them, hot pursuit. Uh, I don't know if you've ever watched a movie and seen where a fighter plane's fire, firing at an enemy plane, they fire a laser, and no matter where that plane goes, what's the laser-guided missile do? Follows it wherever. You know, he said, this is like I see the, the godless in my world key on a godly person, a righteous person, a moral person, and they pursue him like a heat-seeking missile until they finally nail him, and they do it in pride. He, he said, I, I can't believe this. They take par- care of, they take, take advantage of people, and they, aff- they afflict them. Uh, when my father passed away in, in 2008, uh, before I moved here, uh, my mother, after the funeral, began to... Uh, and my mother lives here now. She moved here before Christmas. So she's enjoying the, the humidity, I think. Um, and and, and when, when my father passed away, he had multiple bank account, or multiple bank cards uh, because he was in charge of five Western states, anything seized by the IRS, the Secret Service, uh, or U.S. Customs, um, Homeland Defense. And so he had, he had things stored all over the Southwest, um, down to Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber's home, he had in a 100,000 square foot vault. Uh, so he had things all over the place in vaults. Uh, and so he had all these credit cards that he, if they seized drug money, he would go into a bank with like a million dollars and deposit the drug money and things. I mean, he was all over the place. So he zeroed these things out when he was finished. Well, when he died, my mother went uh, to go cancel the cards, and she can tell you the whole story if you want to talk to her. She went to go cancel all the cards that he zeroed out, and the bank, told, uh, the visa company told her, uh, you can't cancel these out because there's thousands of dollars on these cards. She's like, huh? Excuse me? Well, it took a lot of investigation by my tenacious mother to find out that one of the secretaries in one of my dad's offices in one of those states had, after his death, sold all of his private information to a, a, a national uh, gang who then opened cards in his name and then charged away for one year. One year. They were high-fiving each other 
but they didn't know they were tangling with Sue Baker. She was not going to let them go, but they're taking advantage of a, of a senior citizen at the death of her husband. I could think of nothing more unconscionable, and they went after my father, who had was deceased, and his wife with, with total pride that nothing's going to stop them. See, David says, I saw it in my day and age, and I look at it in my day and age, and it's, yeah, yeah. Lord, when are you going to do something about that? Two, he says, the wicked boast of his evil. They boast about it. They're not even, they're not even bashful. He says in verse three, for the wicked boast of his heart's desire, and the greedy man curses and spurns the Lord. I mean, when they rip somebody off, um, uh, when, when they overly pad their sales commission, whatever they do, and I used to sell deep sea boats, so I understand when people will come in to buy deep sea boats and it's gonna be a huge expense, we would go back into the back room and we'd pull a file, back, this is pre, pre-computers, and, and you would pull a file and you'd see what, how much we were into this boat for and then you could figure out how much commission you wanted to make. That's how it worked. Well, I was a Christian doing that. The, not all the salespeople were Christian. They were going for as much as possible they could get out of that boat from those people. See, it's that, it's that, Boasting, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get these people for you know 45 percent markup, and and they would boast about it. High five! They totally closed the deal. They totally bought the boat for that figure. See, they they boast of their heart's desire and and they're greedy about it. You know anybody like that? They rip you off. Before I came here, I was just getting ready to. I mean, sermon illustrations are not hard to find. You know, I mean, they're everywhere. I'm, when I'm getting ready to come here, I got a text message, uh, and it's somebody telling me, you know, uh, they want me to, you know, respond to them to, to, get, this, to get this loan and get this, to get this money going, and, uh, you know, they just need me to call them, blah, blah, blah. And I hit the little thing, and there's like nine, they've, they've bombarded me with nine text messages to, to give them information to get a loan. Huh? I'm thinking sermon illustration. I hit nuke. I mean, block this caller. Uh, but they're, they're, they're constantly pursuing people, wicked, they boast. And if, had, I, had I typed in all my personal information, somebody somewhere in the United States would have been high-fiving each other that, oh, we got another one. See, David says, I, get, I got so tired of those kind of people. Verse uh, four, he says, item number three, the, the wicked, they are a law unto themselves. He says, the wicked in his haughtiness of his countenance does not seek him. They don't think about God. He says, all of his thoughts are, what's his mantra? There's no one here, so we can talk. It's a small group. What's, what's his mantra? There's no God. See, the thinking is, if there's no God, then I, hey, I can do what I want to do. There's going to be judgment day, no accountability. Truth is relative. I can do what I want to do. That's how they live. They are a law unto themselves. Uh, our culture has completely writ- rewritten the Ten Commandments. In fact, they don't even like the Ten Commandments on buildings. Why? Well, it, it bothers them. Because it's a reminder that, well, there's absolute law, and then there's sin, and God will judge. And so we don't, they don't even like them in our buildings anymore. But see, they, there's a book I read several years ago uh, called The New Absolutes. Now, the book is not new, uh, it, because it was written, uh, let me see when it was written. It was written uh, back in 1996. Would, would you call that new? So the book is not new, but the, the concepts are still applicable today. It's called the new absolutes, and what the, the man does is he goes through, these used to be the old absolutes we held as a culture. These are the new absolutes that have replaced those. Uh, I'll give you one as a case in point. Uh, old absolute. Religion is the backbone of American culture, providing moral and spiritual light needed for public and private life. That's the old absolute. What's the new one? Uh, he says religious, religion is the bane of public life, so for the public good it should be banned from the public square. That's the new one. And he goes down through multiple uh, chapters where he goes through old absolutes, been replaced by new absolutes. Because after all, if there's no absolute truth, then man's free to do what he wants to do. I don't know if you remember Billy Joel. Do you remember Billy Joel? Yeah. I have, I have a lot of his music. In fact, I have, I have the piano music for that album. It's a really fun album to, to play on the piano because he's a piano man. Um, do you remember that song? Um, where he says, they say there's a heaven for those who will wait. Some say it ain't better, but I say it ain't. I'd rather laugh with the who? Sinners than to cry with the saints. I'm seeing how tapped in you are to our culture. Um, The sinners are much more what? Fun, fun. Uh, You know that only the good die young. I tell you, only the good die young, only the good die young. So what's he telling Virginia in the song? You know the lady in the song? 
He said, hey, come on out. Hang out with a guy like me. I mean, I don't believe in absolutes, and hey, just you'll enjoy life to the fullest. See, uh, Billy Joel's thinking still alive and well in our day and age. You know, who'd want to be a saint? They don't have any fun. Uh, verse uh, five, he says, the fourth concept is the wicked see, seem to always get what they want. He says in verse five, his ways prosper at all times. I mean, that's the way it seems. Like they get away with things and nothing happens to them. Haven't you ever thought that when you're on the freeway? I thought about this the other day. I mean, think about it. I think about it all the time when I'm driving, you know, because I never know who's watching me. Um, you know, I was, I was a little bit over the speed limit, maybe five miles an hour, and some guy goes bla- blazing past me. This is like a 65 mile an hour speed zone. Say I was doing 70. He went by about 90. And I'm thinking to myself, I would be the guy that would probably get the ticket because they're probably not going to get him. Do you ever see those guys pulled over? Nah. You know, because they're, they're fulfilling the sermon. His ways seem to prosper when he's driving. I mean, God, when are you going to pull over somebody like that? I mean, I was in traffic the other day. I'm minding my own business. I'm not paying attention to who's behind me. And there's a guy on like a ninja motorcycle in and out of traffic in between cars. And I mean, he was, I don't even know how he missed people. Haven't you ever wondered, like, how do they not hit a mirror? Haven't you thought these things? Uh-huh. Thought about opening your door? Just, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, see, his way seems to prosper all the time. God, think about uh, Jezebel. Um, scale of one to 10, 10 being a righteous woman, one is not, where is she? Probably a one, maybe not even a one. Uh, her husband wanted the vineyard of Naboth uh, in 1 Kings 21, and she's wondering why is the king all down in the mouth, and he's like, I really want that guy's vineyard. I want his land. Well, she's like, you're the king. Set up a scenario where you can seize it. So she did. So she set up uh, old uh, Naboth and uh, had him, uh, you know, come to a party where she had some uh, false witnesses come and accuse him of being anti-Israel. He's a traitor to the king. And so nobody investigated the situation. They took him out and they stoned him to death. And then she seized his land and said, here you go, honey. What a wicked woman, Jezebel. Uh, Her day eventually came, but for many, many years, it seemed like she prospered at will. Five, David says the wicked could care less about God's law. Here he circles back to what he said earlier because it so disturbs him that the wicked constantly defy the law. He says, God, your judgments are on high, but where are they in the the, the mind of a person who doesn't uh, honor God? They're not even in his sight. He's not even thinking about them. He says, God, uh, your, your law is so high and lofty, but the godless, they don't even think about it. They, they don't even think about their, their law. They think, your law, they think about their law. So they've come up with their own 10 commandments. That's what they do. It's how they live with their conscience. Uh, I'll give you some of their 10 commandments that I hear in the culture. Uh, thou shalt not worry about perversion of any sort. In fact, there's really no such thing as perversion. Uh, thou shalt not deny uh, thyself any kind of pleasure, no matter what it is. Uh, thou shalt seek indictments without adequate investigations. That's new commandment. Thou shalt denigrate anyone who shares facts with you to show you that your position's erroneous. Uh, they don't want to hear the facts. Uh, thou shalt call your opponents the names of which you are really uh, guilty of so they, they will suffer and not you. I, I see that all the time. Uh, thou shalt say one thing in public and another thing in private. Uh, thou, thou shalt uh, substitute vile words, yelling and screaming for sound argumentation. And on and on and on go. God, your rules aren't even in their hearts. They're devising their own rules. David says, when are you going to show up, God, and fix that situation? Number six, he says, the wicked mock anyone who opposes him. Notice what he says. All for, as for all of his adversaries, what does he do? He snorts at them. Now, we don't typically do this unless you're laughing, correct? And with somebody laughing so hard, they snort. Then everybody points at them and says, <laughs> they snorted. Yeah, that is not what he's talking about. He's saying, this, this kind of person is so arrogant, so cocky, that that when they hear truth, they're, they're like a horse pushing air through its nose. It's this loud exhalation of air, like, can you believe this? See, when they hear truth, they are so cocky, so self-assured in their position, uh, they're, they're pushing air in, uh, out of their, their nose in total disgust. Jeremiah chapter 20, Jeremiah uh, dealt with this in his day and time. It says in chapter 20, verse 7, uh, he says, all day long I am an object of laughter everyone mocks me he says whenever i speak i must cry out violence and outrage and i i proclaim he says the word of the lord has brought me reproach and derision all day long i say i would not mention him god 
uh, because every time he does, he, he's, he's derided by the culture. I will no longer even speak his name, but then it is as if it's a fire burning in my heart, imprisoned in my bones. I grow weary holding it back. I can't do this. He says, God, you called me to speak truth through my dying dead culture, and when I do it, they mock me. And he says, this is so getting to me. I, I'm at the point where I don't even think I want to talk about it anymore, but but when I say I'm not gonna talk about it, your truth burns in my body. Like, it's like my bones are on fire to speak truth. You ever feel like that? Been there many times. Seven, the wicked thinks he's invincible. Verse six, he says to himself, I will not be moved. Through all, all generations, I'll not see adversity. See, Pharaoh thought this. Pharaoh thought that uh, he could treat the Israelites, his slaves, however he wanted to, and nothing would ever happen to him. In Exodus chapter five, verse two, Pharaoh answers Moses and says this. When it, Moses, the old man, tells him, you need to let the Israelites go, what does he say? Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. He had no idea who he was talking to. See, that's what people do when they get so full of their sin, they think that, well, that they're invincible. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, once said back in the mid-1800s, in a sermon on this passage. He says, this is the ruin of fools, that when they succeed in their sin, they become too big. They swell with conceit as if their summer would last forever and their flowers bloom on eternally. He then says, be humble, O man, for thou art a mortal, and thy lot is mutable. Translated, you're gonna have to stand and give account to God one day. He's absolutely right. And that's why David's praying, God, might they give account so righteousness can reign. The eight things David says that bothers him uh, is that the wicked is verbally vile and de deceitful with their vile verbiage. It says in verse seven, that his mouth is full of what? Curses, translated foul language. Uh, a deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is mischief and wickedness. See, Jesus was right. When Jesus said in Matthew 15, verse 18, here's what he said. But the things that come out of the mouth come from where? From the heart. They defile. See, out of the abundance of words, Jesus says, the heart speaks. You know, all you have to do is go on some people's Facebook page to see who they really are. Because they can say one thing. Sometimes Christians say one thing. Go on their Facebook page, and, and they're dropping words that we don't even want to talk about. Left and right and left and right. And, and I hear this as a pastor. It's shocking to me. It's that duplicity, that deception. Well, I'm a righteous person, but then over here off to the side, uh, you're not talking like one. Because those kinds of words are all about oppressing other people. David says, uh, uh, I, I can't believe people like that. And then nine, he says, the wicked, they hunt the godly moral person. They hunt them. Uh, in verse eight, he says, he sits the godless, in lurking places of the villages. In hiding places, he kills the innocent. He, he eyes stealthily, watch, he watches for the unfortunate. He lurks in the hiding place as a lion in a lair. He lurks uh, to catch the afflicted. He catches the afflicted when he draws him into his net. This is like hunting for a bird. He crouches, he bows down, and the unfortunate fall by his mighty ones. He says, the wicked, they're, they're constantly thinking, how can I take a godly person who bothers me and silence them. Is that not our culture? Absolutely, absolutely. See, Jeremiah, it says in uh, chapter 18, verse 18, concerning the wicked people that he had just told truth to, notice how they respond to him in verse 18 of chapter 18. Come, they said, after they heard truth from Jeremiah, let us devise a plot against Jeremiah, for instruction will not perish for, from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophets. Come, let us destroy him by his own tongue. Let us pay careful attention to his every word. I'm telling you, if this is not our culture, nothing is. What do they do in our culture today? They're looking for certain words that you say, pull them out of context, and then they cancel you, don't they? Well, you're not gonna be on YouTube anymore and you're not gonna be on Twitter anymore and you can't be on Facebook anymore because you've said things that we deem are not appropriate. And sometimes they aren't appropriate. But a lot of times they're just keying in on godly people. Um, like when I was uh, banned last year from YouTube because the sermons were problematic. <laughs> huh? Okay. Have I changed since then? No, no. Because I'm Jeremiah. 
you got to be Jeremiah to your culture. See, it's, they're just waiting for that one little thing. They're not paying attention to their own sin. That's the hypocrisy. David uh, goes back uh, in verse 11. He says, uh, says to himself, uh, the godless says to himself, God has forgotten. Uh, he's hidden his face. He'll never see it. He'll, he'll never pay attention to what we're doing. See, the longer God waits and is patient with the godless, the godless think there is no God and we can do what we want. But God is patient and he's loving and he's kind and he's merciful. He's way more patient than we ever were or are. And he waits for the godless to turn from their sin longer than we would ever give them time to turn. And thank God that he's patient because that's how I got saved. That's how you got saved. And he, and he says that they're thinking that he will not ever move, but God will move. See, our culture is big on, on listing things they think are sinful, and some of them are, but they forget the other things God says really bother him. Here's some things that really bother God. Proverbs 6, verse 16. There are six things the Lord, what? Hates him, hates him. Yes, no, he says there's seven, that they're an utter abomination to him. What's the first one? Haughty eyes. What is that? Pride. Pride. Total arrogance. Haughty eyes. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that plots wicked schemes. Um, you know, feet that are quick to run to evil. Wow. Have we not seen that? The false witness who utters lies and those who sows discord among his kindred. We have a lot of people in our culture sowing discord instead of uh, trying to achieve peace. See, these are the things that grieve the heart of God. There's other things, no doubt, but these are some of the, the big seven. What's the first one? Pride. Because pride is the root of all sin. It's the sin that caused the Satan to fall from his position as the chief cherub. Um, he fell based on pride. That he thought, according to Isaiah 14, that he could become like God himself, full of himself. So David just shared uh, his, his heart. And when you want to move from hopelessness to hope, you got to get real. You got to get real. You got to share what you're feeling so that God can then take those things and begin to, to work in your life to bring uh, healing and to bring answers to those things. Verse 12 through 16 introduces a second thing where he says, in addition to sharing God your, your, your heart, those things that you see that bother you in your culture, he says, get real about your pleas, the pleas that you give to God. Notice what he says to God. He says, arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the afflicted. Uh, this is a, a command from a lesser, David, to a greater God. And he, he says, God, I know you're eternal, because he uses the word L-O-R-D again, capitalized. He says, God, I know you're eternal. I know that you're there, but may I live to see you step into my culture and bring justice where there's injustice. Would you, would you do that? When is the last time you asked God to do that? I mean, I know it's easy to sit and read articles and watch the news and stuff and complain or fret and worry, but when's the last time you stop and listen to what you just saw and said, God, man, I would really love to see you step in and do something awesome in our country. I would, would you step in? See, sometimes God's just waiting for us to pray uh, for him to, to arise. He wants to test our faith. Verse 13, he, David stops and says, why, why have the wicked spurned God? Uh, he said to himself, you will not require it. You have seen it, for you have beheld mischief and vexation to take it into your hand. Uh, the unfortunate commits himself to you. You have been the helper, helper of the orphan. Translated, he, he says, he just stops in his plea and says, God, why would the godless ever think that you would not ever do anything with that which is sin, sinful and unholy? How, why would they ever get to that conclusion? And then he stops and says, there, there have been the times that I can think that you have stepped in. You have helped the person who's the orphan, the afflicted, the person that has been taken advantage of by the culture. I've seen it. But he says, might, might, you, might you do it in my day and age? Hebrews 4 uh, puts the future in perspective, which men forgets about in verse 13 of chapter 4. Here's what the author says of that great book. It says, no creature is concealed from him, God. But e everything, everything, every thought, every word, every action, every motivation, is naked and exposed to the eyes of him who must rent, whom we must render account. You see, the, the New Testament tells us what David was praying for in the Old Testament, it was, he was, this is what he was praying. God, they're forgetting that they're gonna have to give account one day. Are you ready to give account to God? See, David looks back and says, God, I, I, I know from studying the scriptures that you do step in that time, times and listen to the pleas of your people and help them. Noah, 
Think about old man Noah living in a godless culture. And eventually uh, God heard his pleas and God came down in judgment. But, but, but he was there preaching. He was a preacher of righteousness calling his culture uh, to turn to God. Uh, it's, it's that whole movement from the prayer of the saint to move God to do something awesome and great. In verse 15, David says something that might take your breath away. And uh, I don't know that you've probably ever prayed like this. What does he pray? Break the arm of the wicked. and the, Break their arms uh, of the evildoer. See, seek out his weaknesses, weaknesses until you find none. I mean, God, go after them until there aren't any more godless people. Uh, the, not, this is not, um, this is hyperbolic. This is not, he's not saying do this because if you broke somebody's right arm and they're totally godless, they still got another one, right? So this, the breaking of the arm is a sign in the Semitic language of deal, a, deal a, a death blow to their advancement of evil so that, so that righteousness and justice can flood in. When's the last time you ever prayed for God just to flat out stop the advancement of evil that you see around you? There's a, a young man, I don't know if you read his book, it's called The Son of Hamas. Uh, great book. Uh, Mossab Youssef, he was the son of a key Hamas terrorist leader. Many people were praying back in the day for terrorism to take a, take a break and for peace to, to reign. And all the while, God was working in the life of one of the key Hamas leaders uh, in the life of his son. And eventually, that young man came to know Christ. Uh, and because he came to know Christ, he then began to give all kinds of information uh, about terrorist uh, activities that were planned against Israelis and other people, assassinations they had planned. And they were, those things were all thwarted because one young man was the answer to a prayer to many saints who were praying, God, will you, you break wickedness? And God said, I will. I'm gonna save one young man, someone that, will, that you wouldn't even think would get saved. And he, in turn, is gonna save the lives of thousands of people. See, this is how God operates. God is, is great and waits for us to pray. So instead of... Being anxious, worrying, complaining about what you see about you. Uh, do what David did. He shared his heart. God, these are the things I struggle with. And God, here's my plea. Do something about the evil. Let me, let me live to see it. Uh, J. Edwin Orr uh, wrote about revival in the mid-1800s. Uh, and it's, it's worth listening to because it applies to us. He says, two men who worked on Wall Street back in the mid-1800s were so concerned about the moral condition of America in 1857, they decided to meet once a week for prayer about their nation. Once a week, at lunch. They prayed for revival at lunch. Soon, they began to meet every day, and they were joined by other men praying for revival. The group grew so large, they had to start meeting at night in churches and then they invited their wives. So they had this massive group of people praying for their nation. It wasn't long before revival exploded. And he says it raced up uh, the Mohawk River and down the Hudson. At the height of the revival back then, uh, Orr says 10,000 people a week were being converted in New York City. 10,000 people a week went from Satan's kingdom to God's kingdom. It spread down to the Appalachians to the west. A young Chicago shoe, shoe salesman asked to cheat Sunday school and was told that they had too many teachers, but just to go out onto the streets of Chicago and find a class. So he did. Who was one of those little boys in his, in his Sunday school class? Dwight L. Moody. Got saved. Dwight L. Moody became one of the greatest pastors back then to lead the country toward Christ. When the revival jumped the Atlantic, Orr writes, there was a slowdown, I find this so interesting, there was a slowdown in the Welsh coal mines because so many miners were converted, they stopped using bad language and the horses couldn't understand what was being said to them. Because <laughs> all the commands to the horses were in foul language. Uh, in case you didn't quite get that one. Um, and it's much easier doing humor when there's people here. Uh, in London, taverns closed and crime virtually disappeared. The police literally had nothing to do. So they formed quartets and sang at revival meetings. See, we don't need to defund the police, correct? We just need to get the culture saved. Yeah, we need to get the culture saved. Spiritual revival came, social change came, not because of politics, not because of government, because some Wall Street Journal men began to pray, God, would you do something in our country? See, what do we need to do? Personally, a lot less protesting and a whole lot more praying. A whole lot less protesting and a whole lot more praying. God, 
this is the evil we see, and will you please come down and do something that will shock us, something amazing to bring, bring peace. And when God does it, what should we do? Well, that's the last point, and I close with this. Uh, verses 16 to 18, give God praise. Give God praise. Because God is gonna do something in our culture. You know this, right? Because he loves our people. He loves our nation. He's, and, and many godly people are praying. What, when God does something fantastic and brings peace to our nation, what should we do? What does he say? He says, the Lord is king for how long? Forever and ever. Forever and ever. Nations have perished from his land. O oh Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will strengthen their heart. If your heart is anxious today, he will strengthen you. Uh, you will incline your ear to vindicate the orphan and the oppressed so that man who is of the earth will no longer cause terror. You're gonna remove terror. The person who terrorizes other people. Uh, eschatologically, this is looking for the day when the king of kings comes, when Jesus comes. But prior to that, he's saying, God, I know you're the king above all kings, and all kings and people will answer to you one day, but I know that you're gonna step in and help the humble. You're gonna help people who are disadvantaged, who've been taken advantage of, who've been sinned against. And I know you're gonna do something because we're praying about it. Are you praying about it? I'm praying about it. And I think great things are gonna happen because God's hearing our prayers and one day he finally stands up for the, through, from his throne and says, it's time for me to do something. It's time because he is patient. He is kind and long-suffering, but he's also holy and wants to do great things. May our nation come to see revival that it so desperately needs. And may it start with us for God has us. Let's pray. God, thank you just for Psalm 10, written so many thousands of years ago, but the truths that are embedded in it are so appropriate, even for us today. Help us to learn how to apply them, and may it be something that we don't look at others and say, here's what they need to do, but we look at ourselves and say, God, what do you want me to do? And may we go out and do that to bring healing to our nation, and we pray you give us creative ways to do that, and may the church lead the way, and may your saints be those who lead the way. In Christ's name, amen.